As I mentioned earlier, our guest today is Justin Trotte. Um, and that some of you may have listened to Justin um, a little over a year ago. Uh, Justin is the National Executive Director of the Centre for Inquiry for Canada. Um, he's a contributor to the National Post blog. Uh, he's the secular humanist rep for the Michael Corrin Show and the founder of the One School System Network. Um, you may also know that Justin fills in for Greta quite regularly on the John Oakley Show, the Culture Wars show that takes place on Tuesday morning at 9 o'clock, 9, 9 o'clock on Tuesday mornings on AM 680, so if you, or 640. If you get a chance, listen in. You may also, you may hear Greta and you may hear Justin. Um, so our, our readings this morning, um, I'm not sure whether they're twofold, they're onefold. We were planning a video clip and we're experiencing a few difficulties getting it up here. Uh, however, we have another reading. So we were going to have something for you to watch and something for you to listen to, so we're just going to have something for you to listen to. And rather than me doing the reading, I'm going to invite Justin up to do the reading. Um, he'll set the stage with a reading. Uh, we'll have a song following that. And then Justin will take the microphone and share some thoughts on the reading this morning. So Justin, welcome. Do you want to stand up for Should I stand? Whatever you like. Thank you. <laughs> it's great to be back here. So today I'm just going to introduce um, the topic, which is um, spirituality and secularism, or spirituality and, and atheism, um, by a short reading from, um, it's actually a compilation of articles on this topic by mostly scientists called the spirit of science, and it touches on uh, science, scientific naturalism, secular humanism, those kinds of themes, and then how one can have some sort of spiritual awareness or experience or understanding uh, from that natural, natural or naturalistic perspective. Um, the book, uh, again, The Spirit of Science, this particular article is called The Cosmic Blueprint, Self-Organizing Principles of Matter and Energy. Sounds kind of technical, but trust me, there's some good stuff here. Um, the author of this contribution was Paul Davies. Now, he's interesting because he's both a physicist, a very distinguished one. He's won many, many prizes uh, for his physics work. But he's also a philosopher, and his interest is in the meaning and understanding of, of physics and science. Um, so this is, a, this is a couple of decades old, actually, um, but it does reflect some, some fairly cutting-edge science, uh, which the ramifications of which we're still sort of analyzing and coming to terms with right now. So we'll talk about some areas of science. Don't worry too much about the, the science of it. It's more the flavor of what science is, is telling us about interconnectedness and even a sense of spirituality, quote-unquote. I'll get into what that means. Okay. So this is a portion of this contribution that he calls complexification. You'll see why that's important. The process of a progress, of a progressive appearance of structure and organization of the world was referred to at great length by Teilhard de Chardin. He gave it the name complexification, and I suppose that it is more or less what I mean when I talk about increasing organization and complexity. He believed, and so do I, that pervading the entire universe, sorry, the entire cosmos, is an inherent property of matter and energy that is defining this progress. As the universe has evolved over billions of years, so new and ever more elaborate structures and systems have arisen. For example, the immense organization represented by a galaxy has formed from a nebulous swirling cloud of gas. The awesome complexity of the biosphere has evidently arisen from a primitive soup of organic molecules. From these and many other examples, it is clear that the universe has never ceased to be creative, and Teilhard's insistence that we should no longer speak of cosmology, but of cosmogenesis, can never have been more apt, though it was certainly unfashionable at the time. The way we see the universe now in modern cosmology is an ongoing creative process rather than an instant creation event. Although the progressive character of the universe is really a trend rather than a law, I believe it represents a fundamental principle of nature, one that is yet to be encompassed within our understanding of physics and cosmology. 
I can express it no better than by speaking, but, sorry, than by repeating Julian Huxley's description of Teilhard's philosophy, which appears in the introduction to the phenomenon of man. Huxley writes, the different branches of science combine to demonstrate that the universe in its entirety must be regarded as one gigantic process, the process of becoming and of attaining new levels of existence and organization. I'm going to skip ahead now and read the end of this section of this book. I think you'll enjoy this as well. Paul Davies, philosopher and physicist, goes on, Now it's fashionable to declare that the advent of science has pointed out humanity's insignificance, even irrelevance, in the immense universe. An awareness of the size of the physical universe and the vulnerability of our tiny planet have given rise to the idea that humans in particular and life in general is merely some sort of quirk of nature, an incidental feature. Lost my train of thought here. An, a, an incidental feature in the workings of a complex universe, a totally meaningless accident. Well, the discovery of the creative cosmos, which I've been outlining here, has changed all of that. The self-organizing capabilities inherent in matter show that far from the emergence of life being a mere accident, it's an integral stage in the continuing process of matter and energy achieving states of greater and greater organizational complexity. The fact that we live in a creative and progressive cosmos is now at least scientifically respectable. This inevitably raises the question of whether there's a meaning to it all. Is the universe unfolding according to some plan? Is there a cosmic blueprint, as I like to put it? Well, the idea of the universe manifesting some sort of design is a very old one. It seems to me that the most compelling evidence for design is that the laws of physics are constructed in such a way that they permit those self-organizing qualities to exist. Furthermore, that these self-organizing qualities not only give rise to interesting structures of the sort that I've been describing, but they give rise to conscious individuals who can then try to work out these laws and ponder what they all mean. So what does it all mean? Well, science, of course, can't answer questions about meaning, only about mechanisms. There will always be some, scientist, some scientists who will see in the creative cosmos nothing but a pointless charade. Others, however, will find these new developments deeply inspiring, and it will confirm their belief that there is a meaning behind existence. In the end, it has to remain a matter of personal belief. I do think that whatever one's personal beliefs, the discovery that human beings are an integral part of an ongoing complex complexification process bestows on us at least a certain dignity, a dignity we would lack if we were merely an incidental accident amid the vastness of the cosmos. Thank you. That's, uh, that's Paul Davies. I wish I could speak as eloquently as him. Um, but I, I would like to offer some comments. Is that appropriate for me to go into that now? Um, so let me comment on, as I describe it, either secularism or atheism and spirituality, which I suppose might seem at first blush like a, an obvious contradiction. But in fact, none other than Sam Harris, the famous author of The End of Faith and Letter to a Christian Nation, often regarded as one of the more aggressive of the so-called new atheists, he's quick to respond and point out the possible role of the spiritual experience in the life of one who doesn't believe in, in God or gods. There's a YouTube video entitled Sam Harris on Misconceptions About Atheism, and I want to just give you a, a quote from that. Harris says, it's often imagined that atheists are, in principle, close to the spiritual experience. But there's nothing preventing an atheist from experiencing self-transcending love or ecstasy or rapture or awe. There's nothing that prevents an atheist from going into a cave for a year or a decade and practicing meditation like a mystic. What atheists don't do is make unjustifiable claims about the cosmos on the basis of those experiences. But there's no question that disciplines like meditation and prayer can have a profound effect on the human mind. Sam Harris, you may know, is a big fan of Buddhism. Another such fan of Buddhism is C. George Bory, a professor of psychology at Shippensburg University in Pennsylvania who teaches philosophy of psychology. And I'm going to quote at length from an article that he wrote. It's called Thoughts on the Spirituality of Atheism. And I think it touches on a number of the themes that uh, I'd like to, uh, to deal with and explore in this presentation. 
So here's what he writes. He says, I'm an atheist. Now this may seem to not particularly qualify me to talk about spiritual matters, but I believe it does, and uniquely. I see atheism as a sort of minimalist spiritual perspective, one that has stripped away so much of what we usually think of as spiritual, the supernatural, that the essence of spirituality can be more clearly seen. I believe in two things above all, nature and love. Nature is all-powerful. Love is how I understand the good. It might have been nice to believe in God, often defined as both all-powerful and good, but combining the two like that has posed too much of a contradiction for my poor mind to believe in. What about an afterlife? No, I don't believe in that either. You mean you just think you're going to die and that's it? Yeah, that's right. So how can you stand to live? Life is enough. It has to be. It's all there is. But then what's the meaning of life? The meaning of life is in the living of it. Our lives are such small things. Sometimes we think we need something grand to make them worthwhile, like eternal life in paradise, or great success, or intense experience. Or we feel we need a grand philosophy or religion to give our lives meaning. But that's just not true. The world is so incredibly rich, so incredibly complex, that it can overwhelm us. We retreat from the richness of life and love into the semi-conscious state of the workaday world. We retreat into roles and rituals and habits and defensiveness and alcohol and television. We sleepwalk through life and miss the good stuff. And life is hard, very hard for many people. Nature is what it is, does what it does, whether we enjoy it or not. And people, while capable of love, often fail to show it. So we close our eyes and hearts to protect ourselves. Perhaps we even grow a thick layer of callus over our innermost selves. But we, if we close our eyes and hearts, again we miss the good stuff. This is why we need to face our problems instead of hiding from them, accept anxiety and sadness and even pain as inevitable parts of life, rather than pretending that we can only be happy when life is perfect. If we shut down when unhappiness comes our way, we may, may not feel as much pain, but we, are may, but we are no longer open to the small good things of life that make it meaningful. We aren't as alone as we think we are, each of us locked away in some soul walnut. I believe that consciousness is only occasionally restricted to one person's mind. Most of the time it lies somewhere between us. If you are playing pool with a friend, you are really concentrating on the game. For a little while, the two of you are sharing consciousness. He sees what you see, you see what he sees. When you make love with someone, you become lost in each other, lost in the passion of the moment, and share consciousness. When you raise your children, you pass on your values, your dreams, and your quirks. And every now and then, they see the world through your eyes, and you through theirs. I'm not talking about ESP or psychic phenomena. I'm suggesting that we never lived in such separate egos in the first place. We all learn to believe we are isolated, but we aren't. That's how love works. To love means to realize that you and the other person aren't entirely separate, that his or her needs and feelings are yours. It's like looking in someone's eyes and seeing yourself, and that pro provides us with another source of meaning and purpose. Okay, so you have some meaning in your life, but you don't have ultimate meaning, do you? No. Ultimately, as far as nature is concerned, my poor atheist philosophy says it makes no difference if we shut out both good and bad, or experience both good and bad fully. Love or don't love, it doesn't matter to nature. But with open eyes and hearts, we do find meaning, even if it isn't glorified with the title of ultimate. And there I end that ridiculously long quote. To be fair, much of what I've been telling you is probably a bit of a minority opinion among my community of atheists, agnostics, and secularists, secular humanists. I think most would likely respond or answer the term spiritual that it's too vague and ill-defined to make it impossible or meaningless to answer the question as to whether they are spiritual in their non-belief. On the one hand, if spirituality is, de is defined as a kind of subjective experience of the mystery of the universe or an emotional reaction one gets to the wonders of life, and that's easy for many of us to accept. But on the other hand, a God-centered spirituality that invokes the supernatural or realities unexplainable by natural law is like, less likely to find favor among atheists. The website aboutatheism.com has some interesting insights along these lines. 
It concludes as follows. If an atheist is wondering if it would be appropriate to use the term spiritual when describing themselves and their attitudes, the question that must be asked is, does it have any emotional resonance with you? Does it feel like it conveys some aspect of your emotional life? If so, then it may be a term you can use, and it will mean just what you feel it conveys. On the other hand, if it just feels empty and unnecessary, you likely won't be using it because it doesn't mean anything for you. So where do I come down on all of this spirituality stuff? Last summer when I spoke here at West Hill United, I talked about the poetry of science, about the awe and wonder that gives life meaning that I get when I study and explore the natural world. But I also commented on the interconnectedness of all life and of life with the rest of nature. I invoked, for example, the fact that we're all star stuff. I gave the reference to the fact that the sun and other stars inside of the heat of its internal furnace will produce all the complex elements that through a supernova will seed the galaxy with the stuff of future life. This kind of insight, if anything, comes closest to qualifying as a spiritual awareness for me. I'm also fascinated by the self-organizing principles that seem to be at work in the universe, which, as Paul Davies described in that reading I gave earlier, seems to suggest the universe has an inherent ability to move towards both greater complexity and a kind of innovation, even in the face of the overall increase in entropy and disorder. Ironically, these truths about physical reality, which pull me towards a sense of the spiritual, are the same truths which simultaneously tell us that in the long run, the universe is bound to a slow and final heat death. All forms of matter and energy, you see, will in the end get turned from useful to useless, providing us ultimately with that same universe becoming barren, inhospitable, and devoid of life. Now, trust me, that's not for hundreds of trillions of years, so we have some time to, uh, to find meaning before all that takes place. That finding a sense of the spiritual from the imminence of the natural world must also come with a seemingly pessimistic realization of this sort might be ironic. But I think what it does is force each of us into a personal, existential, and very deep decision. We each need to decide how to interpret this dual understanding and how to use it either as a pretext to reject the spiritual entirely or to reinterpret it to give each of us a sense of personal and interpersonal meaning. So I leave you with those thoughts and with a, a warm welcome to hear how you make personal and interpersonal meaning in your life and in this congregation. Thank you for the opportunity to share these thoughts with you today. Thank you, Justin. Thank you very, very much. Thank you for bringing things together so very, very nicely. Um, usually, at this point in the service, Greta so eloquently wraps up with such wonderful words of wisdom. Uh, I envy her. What I heard Justin talking to us today about was a sense of spirituality, and that word has so, so many meanings to all of us. Each one of us probably has a different definition. Um, and as we think about it, I think we can perhaps look at it from a couple of lenses. One is the transcendent sense of spirituality, which is that which is beyond us. And then also there's the thought that it can be imminent, those things that are within us. Um, when I think of spirit, uh, my first thoughts are to my spirit, my sense of what is spirit within me. And so I would refer you to a, a line that Justin used, and it wasn't his words, it was a quotation. And it said, uh, it talked about the meaning of life. We talk about the meanings for words, and the, and the meaning of life is just such a large thing to encompass. And the quotation was, the meaning of life is in the living of it. And so I would offer that to you as you leave here today. The meaning of life is in the living of it. Um, take that with you, and as you think of what spirit means to you, think more about 
how that plays out. What does that lead to? How does that give you into action? And as we close, I wanted to share a second reading. We're not the most organized congregation in the world. Uh, Justin was going to be here this morning, and uh, so I went and said I would find a reading. So I actually found something that was going to be our prayer this morning, only to come and find out that Greta had also prepared a prayer, which is wonderful. Now, my prayer wasn't something that I put together. My prayer is something that I've stolen from somebody else. And it, to me, was a reflection of what I thought we were going to hear this morning. And having heard what Justin talked about, it's right on the money. And I'll give credit to Mr. Kearns over here at the piano because these are his words. When we see the wonder of a sunset, hear sweet music in the air, feel the power in a thunderstorm, sense connection everywhere. It's the wonder of life that we celebrate in awe and gratitude. The miracle of life that amazes us and leaves us humble and moved. As we see with our eyes and hear with our ears and feel in our heart and soul, we realize we are part of the miracle, a part of the wonder of life. Wonderful, wonderful words. Thank you. So I say thank you for being with us this morning and um, take the thoughts and the ideas that Justin has shared with you this morning as you leave this place.